Hi, I'm Jim Spernatopoulos, and we're going to be talking about spinal neoplasms, the cord, the nerves, the meninges, and the mimics. I have no relevant financial disclosures nor conflict of interest to report. If you see any names on any of the images, those are the case contributor to the MedPix teaching file and not the patient's name. Our educational objectives, to describe the most common intramedullary spinal cord masses, to characterize these three common primary tumors, ependymoma, astrocytoma, and hemangioblastoma, and we'll talk a little bit about how to distinguish neoplastic from non-neoplastic masses involving the spinal cord itself. When we classify spinal cord lesions, we talk about intramedullary lesions, intradural extramedullary lesions, which are in the subarachnoid space, and extradural lesions, which are inside the bony neural canal, affecting the bone, the disc, or the ligaments, uh, and also those that are outside of the spinal column itself. The terminology that we use to classify spinal masses is predicated on all the work from myelography from 40 and 50 years ago. We talk about intradural intramedullary lesions, which on a myelogram would expand the shadow of the spinal cord as outlined by the opaque contrast media. Intradural extramedullary lesions are going to be in the subarachnoid space. They're going to displace the shadow of the spinal cord away from them, and they're going to cause a meniscus above and below the lesion within the subarachnoid space. Extradural lesions are going to push the thecal sac as well as the subarachnoid space and the cord away from them. And we've all learned this as the classic tools used for myelography. When we use MR and CT to localize the masses, we might consider a T2 weighted image or a CT myelogram with contrast material to be the same as an old fashioned pantopaque myelogram. We still have expansion of the cord illustrated here on the MR. We have displacement of the uh, subarachnoid space, which on T2 is going to be bright white as illustrated here. And again, on the MR, we can see this herniated disc uh, as compressing the thecal spec, and we're below the level of the spinal cord uh, at this level of the lumbar spine. In terms of the relative frequency of spinal cord neoplasms, the top three have a relatively similar frequency. Schwannomas and meningiomas, which are extramedullary, come in at almost 30% and 25%. Intramedullary gliomas as a group represent a little bit more than one-fifth of spinal cord uh, masses. We also have vascular malformations. We have chordomas as a classic extradural lesion, and we may have in the subarachnoid space epidermoid and dermoid cysts. When we consider the differential diagnosis for intramedullary lesions of the spinal cord, we include the major disease categories, traumatic, like contusion and traumatic edema of the cord, vascular lesions, including ischemia, infarction, and hemorrhage, inflammatory lesions, like demyelination and myelitis caused by infection, and then again, we have the neoplastic processes that we'll talk about in detail as we go along. The extramedullary lesions include subarachnoid hemorrhage and also epidural and subdural hemorrhages as a result of trauma, vascular lesions, which might cause subarachnoid hemorrhage, and dilated vessels in the subarachnoid space, which might arise from a fistula causing varices. We might have meningitis, and in the intradural extramedullary location, we have meningioma, schwannoma, neurofibroma, epidermoid and dermoid inclusion cysts, paraganglioma, and metastatic disease. In the extradural category, we have epidural hematoma, vascular lesions like enlargement of Batson's plexus, interruption of the IVC, vertebral body hemangiomas, inflammatory lesions like osteomyelitis and epidural abscess, and neoplastic processes like lymphoma, osteoblastoma, giant cell tumor, lipomatosis, and metastatic disease to the bony spine. There are also some hints we can take from the vertical localization of masses involving the spinal cord. 
In the cervical spinal cord, intramedullary lesions in adults are usually ependymoma, whereas in children, the intramedullary lesions are going to be astrocytic in nature. Down in the cauda equina, we have the mixopapillary flavor of ependymomas, and we can also have paragangliomas. And the paragangliomas may actually be beneath the pia and within the cord itself, or they may be outside of the pia. We can see flow voids, which might suggest hypervascular lesions like hemangioblastoma and paragangliomas. And if the spine and brain are both involved, we think about primary demyelinating diseases like multiple sclerosis and acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, as well as the possibility of metastatic disease. As a short history lesson, I want to show you the cervical myelogram of a patient that had an intramedullary lesion, which in this case was an astrocytoma of the spinal cord. We can clearly see that the cervical cord is dramatically expanded at the expense of the contrast material opacifying the subarachnoid space. And of course, the oblique films bear this out. The cord is dramatically enlarged. And we always give a differential diagnosis when we see cord enlargement and expanded cord. We have primary and rarely secondary neoplasms. We can have acute MS and other demyelinating diseases like ADEM, longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis, and neuromyelitis optica. We can have primary and secondary syringohydromyelia, and again, infectious myelitis, abscess, granulomatous diseases like sarcoid, vascular, and traumatic lesions. So let's focus now our discussion on neoplastic diseases, and we'll be talking about this group uh, illustrated here. Again, we're going to recognize these because they cause expansion of the diameter and the volume of the spinal cord. Let's start with ependymoma. About 70 to 90 percent of intramedullary primary neoplasms are gliomas, most commonly ependymoma and astrocytoma, and rarely oligodendroglioma. About 65% of the cord gliomas are ependymoma, but we want to remember that there are two different flavors of ependymoma. There are the WHO grade 2 intramedullary ependymomas, and then about 60% of the cord gliomas are of the mixopapillary type, which are grade 1 tumors. And again, these tumors may in involve the cord or they may appear to be in the subarachnoid space. The classic ependymoma is a slowly growing lesion. Cord edema is present in about 85% of the patients. We might see microvascular changes with blood products, the so-called hemosiderin cap, in about 29% of the patients. We see associated cystic changes, oftentimes polar cysts at the top and bottom of the lesion, in about 61% of the cases. The literature reports that the solid areas of the tumor enhance almost universally, but the contrast enhancement is only homogeneous in about 46%, the other cases showing heterogeneous enhancement or nodular enhancement. Ependymomas are usually well demarcated and are often resectable for cure, gross total resection. Ependymomas are thought to arise from radial glial stem cells. The grade 1 ependymomas are the encapsulated mixopapillary ependymomas of the cauda equina and the conus medullaris, and the intracranial interventricular or subependymal tumor is called subependymoma. The most common flavor of ependymoma is the intraventricular and spinal cord grade 2 ependymoma. These may be sporadic or associated with NF2. We can also have ependymomas with Rilaw fusion, which are graded 2 and 3, and we can have, uncommonly, anaplastic ependymomas. Let's look at a typical case of a cervical spinal cord ependymoma. We have expansion of the cord, a partially fluid and partially solid mass, and we can see in this T2-weighted image that there are extensive areas above and below the fluid-filled portion that look like they are hypointense from hemosiderin, which is exactly what's going on here. If we look at the corresponding uh, axial images, we can see that there is a rim of hemosiderin around the outside of the lesion. This is typical for ependymomas. So we like to call this hemosiderim in order to help us remember that blood products are commonly associated with ependymomas. We can also have, in many cases, polar cysts. We can see here the solid portion of the mass showing relatively homogeneous enhancement. 
We can see above a fluid-filled area, which might be secondary or tumor-related syringohydromyelia, or it might be a neoplastic cyst. And we can also see edema extending down below the cord. This is a very typical example of a spinal cord cervical ependymoma. We can look on the axial images and recognize that ependymomas are most commonly going to be centrally located masses because they're thought to arise from the lining of the central canal, which is, after all, ependyma. These images are from two different patients, but they illustrate, again, the sharply demarcated central location of the ependymoma in the expected location of the central canal of the spinal cord is another central cord mass in the cervical spine. We can see that there is some hypointensity around the rim representing hemosiderin. We can see hemosiderin surrounding the cyst or the syringohydromyelia here on this section. And again here, this hypointensity is hemosiderin. So hemosiderin in an adult patient with a cervical cord mass is suggestive that the patient is going to have and ependymoma. And just to top things off, here is another example of ependymoma, and again showing the hemosiderin cap at the top and the bottom. Ependymomas are considered to be circumscribed gliomas. They don't infiltrate into the white matter. They displace the white matter away from They have a pushing margin. If we do tractography on the spinal cord, we'll be able to see that the corticospinal tracts are being displaced by the tumor and not infiltrated or destroyed by the tumor. Again, ependymomas are sharply demarcated masses. Splitting the back of the cord here, we can see this well demarcated sausage-like mass. The ependymoma is removed in its entirety. Again, a centrally located mass. It might have some peripheral reactive gliosis around it and some surrounding spinal cord edema. Histologically, ependymomas are characteristically going to show perivascular pseudorosettes. The cells are arranged in a circle around a vessel. We can see that there are red cells within the vessel, and there are filamentous processes coming out from the cells that extend down towards the lumen of the capillary. This is not universally present, but it is present in the majority of ependymomas. I must think that neuropathologists are deeply religious people who were inspired every Sunday by going to church and seeing the rose window, which bears a remarkable resemblance to how the pseudo-rosette shows things arranged in a circle around the lumen and the cellular processes arranged in a rosette. Let's now turn our attention to the mixopapillary variant of ependymoma. This most commonly presents in the lower spinal area, the conus medullaris and cauda equina. With an intact capsule, it's considered to be WHO grade 1 because the capsule prevents CSF dissemination. After gross total resection, these tumors can be monitored with serial imaging and adjuvant therapy is still being debated. So we're looking here in the area of the conus medullaris. Mixopapillary ependymoma is the most common neoplasm that arises in this location. It shows contrast enhancement, and once again, it is a very sharply demarcated sausage-like mass. It may fill the spinal canal. It may grow slowly and demonstrate remodeling of the surrounding bone. And because they are encapsulated, they don't spread. However, if the capsule is ruptured during surgery, then the patient needs to be monitored very closely for dissemination. Here is another larger mixopapillary ependymoma involving the conus medullaris and the lower uh, lumbar area. About two-thirds of spinal ependymomas are the mixopapillary subtype. Some patients will have multiple different lesions, and again, they fill and slowly expand the uh, space inside of the bony canal. This is a gross photo of a mixopapillary ependymoma showing the cut section. The hemorrhage is perioperative. Why is a tumor called a mixopapillary ependymoma? Mixo comes from the Greek word meaning mucus. I remember as a child coming out of the water while swimming in Greece and having my uncle shout at me, mixa, mixa. 
I had no idea what it meant, and then I realized that I had snot coming out of my nose. So we have these pale blue areas, which are mucoid material. And then it's called papillary, myxopapillary ependymoma, because the tumor forms these papillary structures microscopically. As mentioned before, myxopapillary ependymomas can grow slowly and cause bony remodeling, and they can be quite large and extensive at the time of initial clinical symptomatology. They are soft, toothpaste-like masses that fill the spinal canal, and they may have, in some cases, blood products, just like the intramedullary cervical ependymomas. The lesion here is filling the spinal canal, and we can see here there's been very extensive bony remodeling around the expanded spinal canal in the area of the sacrum. And this is the grand champion, myxopapillary ependymoma. Again, a very sharply demarcated expansile lesion causing periosteal remodeling of the posterior aspects of the vertebral bodies. A really large and extensive lesion. Now we should turn our attention to astrocytomas. Remember that ependymomas, astrocytomas, and hemangioblastomas are the three most common spinal cord neoplasms. Can we tell them apart? Well, the patients who have astrocytomas are usually younger, and they may have pilocytic astrocytomas that can present with intratumoral cysts. The lesions are most likely to be cervical or thoracic, and less often lumbar or conus medullaris, so we can potentially distinguish them from paragangliomas and myxopapillary ependymomas. They're less likely to have blood, so hemosiderin and signal dropout is going to be rare. And the enhancement poorly correlates with histology, unlike in intracranial astrocytomas where the diffuse lesions have a good correlation of a high grade with contrast enhancement. This is a six-year-old boy who had neck pain and a clumsy gait. A dramatically expanded cervical spinal cord is seen. It looks slightly heterogeneous. When we do T2-weighted imaging, we can see that there are fluid-like areas that vary in signal intensity. I was always taught that any time you see fluid in the cord, you must give contrast enhancement because the fluid could be tumoral cysts or could be related to a tumor causing associated secondary syringohydromyelia. So when we give contrast to this patient, we're going to be able to demonstrate the solid portions of the tumor. And there they are. So some of the areas that appear fluid-like on T1 and T2 are actually solid tumor regions that have microscopic cysts. In cross-section, the lesion is quite extensive, but it's not exactly centrally located in the cord. And again, this is a young patient, potentially distinguishing it from an ependymoma. So this expansile intramedullary lesion extending the full length of the cervical spinal cord with both fluid and solid enhancing components was a pilocytic astrocytoma. Here's another child with a cervical astrocytoma. Again, it's a very long, extensive lesion. Again, it is fluid-like. Are some of these fluid-like areas actually going to be solid tumor with contrast enhancement? Well, if we look post-giving contrast material, we're going to be able to see a large area of enhancement. So much of what we thought was merely fluid was actually solid tumor. We also see apical or polar cysts, just like we did in the ependymoma. But again, remember, this is a younger patient where ependymomas of the cord are less likely to present. So in the spinal cord glioma differential diagnosis, the age of the patient can be important. The location, central versus eccentric, can be important. The morphology of well-circumscribed versus more ill-defined in pilocytic astrocytoma. Hemorrhage is common in ependymomas, but uncommon in astrocytomas. The enhancement can be patchy and irregular in astrocytomas. And the ependymomas are much more likely to involve the lower end of the cord, and it's atypical for a conus medullaris lesion to be an astrocytoma, even in a child. Here's another pilocytic astrocytoma. In T1 and T2 weighted images, it appears 
somewhat fluid-like, when we give gadolinium contrast material, we can see that there is patchy heterogeneous enhancement. And here is yet another pilocytic astrocytoma of the cord in a child. Notice that this tumor takes up almost the entire extent of the spinal cord. It's heterogeneous. It has fluid-like areas, some of which are actually solid tumors showing enhancement after giving gadolinium. This is a very, very sad, yet all too common feature of astrocytomas of the spinal cord in children. They can be very extensive and even involve the entire cord, hollow cord tumors. Again, the fluid-like areas extend from top to bottom, but some of these fluid-like areas we saw showed contrast enhancement. And here's another one. And although I said they're uncommon in the lower end of the cord, this was an anaplastic astrocytoma that did involve the lower end of the spinal cord. There are no distinctive features compared to astrocytoma or ependymoma when they arise in this location. Because they grow very slowly, there can be very extensive remodeling and widening of the interparticular distance in the cord that's affected. And we can see here in the sagittal images, again, a very, very large extensive lesion involving the lower half of the thoracic spinal cord. And astrocytomas can also have polar cysts, just like we saw in ependymomas. Don't throw your hands in the air and say you can't tell them apart, because the features that we look for are the age of the patient as a very helpful feature. And sometimes it's fair just to say, I'm not sure what kind of glioma this is going to be. And once again, some of the fluid-like areas actually showed contrast enhancement because they were solid areas in the pilocytic astrocytoma. So polar cysts and enhancement can occur in both ependymomas and in pilocytic astrocytomas. We can see here in the axial images that the tumor shows patchy but relatively uniform enhancement over the cross-section of the tumor. And here's yet another one breaking the rules down in the lower end of the cord. So spinal cord astrocytomas are the second most common intramedullary tumor. They occur in children and young adults. Uh, lower grade tumors are more common and they're usually going to present in the cervical cord but they may be seen in the thoracic and lumbar regions. The last of the intermedullary neoplasms that we're going to discuss is the hemangioblastoma, which we all remember is closely associated with von Hippel-Lindau disease. Hemangioblastomas, both in the cord and in the cerebellum and brainstem, are typically fluid-secreting tumors that have the neoplasm limited to a nodule in the wall of the fluid-filled space, the so-called neural nodule. Patients with von Hippel-Lindau disease classically are going to present with multiple enhancing nodules and they may have multiple cysts as illustrated here in this example from Greg Peterman. And again, this is an unusual case because the patient had a small, solid, supratentorial hemangioblastoma right along the edge of the tentorium. Hemangioblastomas have been called many things in the past, including angioblastic meningiomas and Lindau's tumor. They're thought to arise from mesodermal precursor cells that give rise to endothelial cells and hematopoietic cells. About 20% of the patients will have von Hippel-Lindau disease. The lesions may be multiple in 5% of the patients without von Hippel-Lindau disease. The age peak is typically described as being between 30 and 45 years of age. There is a slight male predominance in some series, and the lesions are classically described as being subpeal when they're in the cerebellum. Treatment is by surgery or sometimes radiation if tumor remnants remain. And in some series, the prognosis is very good with more than 90% surviving at five years. Here's another example of a more classic hemangioblastoma that has a sharply demarcated fluid-filled space and a very brightly enhancing uh, mural nodule involving the cervical cord. 
Spinal hemangioblastomas, like their intracranial partners, are WHO grade 1. They represent up to 15% of cord tumors. The vast majority are intramedullary, but you want to remember that as many as 1 in 7 may arise or present in the caud equina or the nerve roots. They're much more common in the thoracic spine, but that's probably because there simply is more thoracic spine. And again, 20% of patients will have multiple lesions, and about 20% of the patients will be genetically testing positive for the von Hippel-Lindau mutation on chromosome number three. Features suggestive for hemangioblastoma include a clearly defined cyst, flow voids in the subarachnoid space showing the hypervascularity, and they may also have signs of hemorrhage, although that's not particularly common for hemangioblastomas. Histologically, the hemangioblastoma consists of variable sized vascular spaces, and between these vascular spaces are these foamy, lipid laden stromal cells. We can see in the gross picture that the tumor is reddish in color because of all the vascular spaces. Again, hemangioblastoma is a true neoplasm arising from embryologic arrest of the hemangioblast, which have the potential to differentiate into both endothelial and hematopoietic elements. I wanted to show you this superb example of hemangioblastoma's von Hippel-Lindau disease, demonstrating not only that there are multiple lesions, but there are very prominent flow voids in the subarachnoid space, and that these nodular lesions involve the caud equina nerve roots as well as involving the cord itself. In case you wanted proof that hemangioblastomas can arise outside of the cord itself, even though they're classically described as intramedullary lesion, I want to show you this example of a VHL patient. It's an older case, but you can see we have an autopsy specimen showing the caudi equina and showing multiple lobulated reddish masses, all of which were hemangioblastomas. I shared these images with a friend of mine who told me that these must be drop metastasis from hemangioblastoma. And when I discussed this with the neuropathologist, they said, these tumors, these hemangioblastomas, don't metastasize. These are all individual primary tumors because the patient has a germline mutation in the VHL gene. The last of the spinal intramedullary neoplasms that I want to show you is not even on our list. It's the paraganglioma. Paragangliomas occur in the southern end of the cord in the conus medullaris region, and they're sometimes considered to be intraaxial intramedullary or extraaxial in the subarachnoid space. So basically, they're a bridge lesion from our localization plan of intramedullary and extramedullary. Paragangliomas are histologically covered by PIA, so they should be called intramedullary, but they often appear separate from the cord so they can look extramedullary. They are part of the differential diagnosis of lesions in the conus and caudi equina area. They're relatively uncommon. Uh, the most common lesions, as we've mentioned before, are the myxopapillary ependymoma, and then the differential diagnosis for the extramedullary lesions that we will continue with in just a few minutes. Although spinal cord paragangliomas are relatively uncommon, you can sound totally brilliant if you always include them in your differential diagnosis for a conus medullaris or caudi equina mass. And occasionally, maybe once or twice in your lifetime, you'll be correct when you suggested the possibility of a paraganglioma. If we have prominent flow voids, in addition to hemangioblastomas, paragangliomas have also been described as having prominent flow voids. So here is a histologically proven cauda equina uh, paraganglioma. And we can see there are some very, very dramatic flow voids coming off the lower edge of the lesion. We can see here the lesion shows contrast enhancement. And once again, we can see the flow voids. The paragangliomas that we see inside the spinal canal are non-chromophon. They're too small to have endocrine effects, and most of the endocrine effects that we see in other paragangliomas occur when the hormonal precursor product is activated by metabolism in the liver, and the venous drainage from the spinal cord does not pass directly through the liver. 
Again, they can be hypervascular. They may have blood products. They can also begin as a small rounded mass, but they will continue to grow. Histologically, as you probably heard, the periganglioma is characterized by what's called zell ballin or cell ballin. We have a ball of cells with the vessels surrounding the outside of the cluster of cells. Here's another spinal cord paraganglioma with some flow voids or some areas of hemosiderin causing hypointensity uh, on the images. And again, nothing specific or characteristic would distinguish this from an ependymoma or a mixopapillary ependymoma or even a schwannoma. So mentioning paraganglioma occasionally is going to be correct, but usually not so much. And again, we have this beautiful path correlation here with the operative photo showing this paraganglioma as it is being resected. Let's switch gears and turn our attention to extra medullary spinal cord lesions. Remember, these extra medullary lesions are actually located within subarachnoid space. They're going to displace the outline of the cord, and at the top and the bottom of the lesion, they're going to be characterized by what's called a meniscus sign around the lesion. The most common of these lesions is going to be the meningioma. So let's start with that. Meningiomas of the spinal cord are described as being most common in the thoracic spine. And the simple explanation for this is there is more thoracic spine. There are seven cervical segments, five lumbar segments, but there are 12 thoracic segments. So there's just a longer extent of meninges that can develop into a neoplasm like a meningioma. And again, the lesion looks exactly the way we would imagine. Let's look at some beautiful rad path correlation. This old pantopic myelogram shows a filling defect in the column of contrast material in the cervical spine. Again, the lesion is going to be displacing the subarachnoid space and pushing the cord off to the right side of the slide. And the lesion looks exactly the way you would imagine. You couldn't put together a more beautiful rad path correlation than this example of a spinal cord meningioma. In cut section, the lesion is very, very fibrous, which is common for some subtypes of meningioma. In this patient, we have a samomatous meningioma, the subtype that is chock-a-block full of microscopic calcifications. So many calcifications that the lesion has very low signal intensity on the T2-weighted image, and the lesion has so much calcium that it's actually visible on the plane radiograph. How many of you were able to diagnose intraspinal tumors using plain radiography? Well, in this case, we could. Now, here's something that looks exactly like a meningioma, but it's not a meningioma. This is the patient that has a very similar appearing tumor with a very different histology. This is the solitary fibrous tumor. Part of the spectrum of solitary fibrous tumor is that the more aggressive lesions are similar to or actually are hemangiopericytoma. But the SFT is a WHO grade one tumor. It's not a meningioma. And again, in cross section, the lesion is extra medullary, extra axial. It's displacing the CSF and pushing the cord off to the side, just like the diagrams that we use to explain the localization scheme. Although many neuropathologists were reluctant to group SFT and hemangiopericytoma in the same category, the burgeoning of molecular markers demonstrated that both of these tumors have nuclear STAT6 mutations, and therefore they have a common genetic origin. In terms of MR spectroscopy, hemangiopericytomas make myoinositol that may be useful, at least in larger examples where you can get a clean voxel. So the hemangiopericytoma, which was formerly called an angioblastic meningioma, is part of the spectrum that begins at the lowest grade, grade one, with the solitary fibrous tumor. They're relatively uncommon. They've been reported to have a slight male predilection, and most of the patients are in their 40s at the time of clinical presentation. The next group of intradural extramedullary lesions are the nerve sheath tumors. Let's begin with the schwannoma, which is far more common than When looking at our spinal MRs, especially the T1-weighted images, we want to remember that fat is your friend. It cushions and protects. 
it fills the intervertebral neural foramen so that there is always a cushion or a space surrounding the nerve artery and vein. If we look at this example here, we can see a soft tissue mass has filled one of the intervertebral neural foramina, and this is likely to be a nerve sheath tumor. In the old days, we would do a myelogram and we would see a filling defect like the one shown here as a classic example of the rounded mass and configuration we typically see with schwannomas. So always look very carefully at, at this keyhole shaped structure, which is the neural foramina, the exit zone for the nerve roots. We can see in the axial image that we have an enhancing, relatively homogeneously enhancing soft tissue mass that has grown slowly enough to cause remodeling of the adjacent vertebral body and the neural arch. The schwannoma typically is going to be peripheral or exophytic to its parent nerve, and we can see in cross-section that they can be, in some cases, hemorrhagic. Schwannomas are encapsulated lesions and typically uh, displace uninvolved axon cylinders or uninvolved nerve fascicles to the side. So they are often described as eccentric. Let's take a brief moment to talk about neurofibromatosis type 2. NF2 is an autosomal dominant disorder typically caused by a germline mutation in chromosome 22 that produces three neoplasms, schwannomas, which can be either intracranial or intraspinal, craniospinal meningiomas, and ependymomas that are typically most common in the cervical cord as opposed to intraventricular. The most common presentation is with bilateral vestibular schwannomas, as shown here. In the sagittal MR image, we see all three of these lesions. We see an enhancing intramedullary lesion, which is an ependymoma, and we see an extramedullary lesion, which is a meningioma. If we look at the sagittal spinal images, we can see multiple nodules inside of the spinal canal, and these are relatively isointense to the spinal cord itself. These are multiple schwannomas. This is a different patient showing the same thing in NF2, multiple filling defects in the pantopate common, each one of which is associated with a nerve root. And if we look at the gross picture in the same patient, we can again see multiple swellings along the course of the nerve roots, as well here as swellings inside of the cord, which are focal schwannomas that are intramedullary. I'll bet you didn't know that you could have intramedullary schwannomas, and you can in patients who have NF2. I like to call NF2 the Miss Me Syndrome, and because I'm Greek, I want to hear a Greek chorus as you all repeat after me, multiple inherited schwannomas, meningiomas, and ependymomas. Those are the major manifestations that we see in neurofibromatosis type 2. Let's switch gears now and talk about intraspinal neurofibromas. Neurofibromas, even at the microscopic level, tend to be multiple and diffuse. As this cartoon illustrates, even within a single nerve fascicle, we see multiple areas of abnormality. We oftentimes recognize that the parent nerve passes into the center of the mass, and the mass oftentimes consists not only of cellular components, but of a large amount of extracellular perineural matrix material. This plain radiograph of the spine demonstrates multiple paraspinal masses, all of which are neurofibromas. Unlike the encapsulated and focal lesion that we expect for a schwannoma, neurofibromas very commonly are going to be fusiform and infiltrate and extend along the course of the nerve. This patient with NF1 has involvement of virtually every one of the cervical nerve roots and the lumbosacral nerve roots. And this is a different patient who also illustrates the same phenomenon, multiplicity of lesions involving practically every nerve that can be identified on the imaging. And if we look down here, we can see massive enlargement of the uh, sacral plexus. So when we think about neurofibromas, the classic term we use is the dumbbell lesion because these tumors are going to be infiltrating and spreading along the course of the nerve. And if we look at the coronal image, we can see how the tumor is intraspinal, 
passes through the neural foramen where it is compressed or constricted giving it the dumbbell shape and then the mass extends into an extra or peri in addition to causing the paraspinal and intraspinal neurofibromas nf1 also causes by pulsation of the subarachnoid space erosion of the posterior aspects of the vertebral bodies what is called vertebral body scalloping this does not occur in patients who have nf2 so seeing the intradural extramedullary filling defects and masses in combination with vertebral body scalloping should be a big clue that the patient has nf1 and that the lesions are actually going to be neurofibromas this coronal image in the same patient demonstrates vertebral body scalloping and enlargement of the axial root sleeve subarachnoid space in the region of the cauda equina as well as a gigantic lesion which is mostly extra or paraspinal and that is another neurofibroma let's finish up by talking about a couple of other lesions epidermoid inclusion cysts these are also intradural extramedullary they may present as a soft tissue mass that looks water-like or it may have t1 shortening and be bright on t1 weighted images sometimes they can be slightly heterogeneous they are going to be extramedullary or extra axial displacing the cord to the side this is a pediatric patient who had a myelogram for unexplained back pain and a very extensive intradural epidermoid inclusion cyst and you can see here in very bad form that the needle was inserted into the center of the mass kind of like a kebab effect if we look at the operative photo here we can see the spinal cord and then when the spinal cord is retracted to the side we can see this waxy flaky looking appearance for an intradural extramedullary epidermoid inclusion cyst let's look now at an example of a spinal lipoma we can see here in the cervical cord there is no evidence of dysraphism Intracranial intraspinal lipomas often arise from abnormal differentiation from the precursor for the meninges, the Menninx primitiva, just like uh, corpus callosum lipomas. And we can see here that the lesion is very homogeneous and completely has the signal of fat. On the cross sectional CT image, it also has the lucency or low attenuation of fat. And on the sagittal MR and the corresponding posterior view with the surgical resection, this has a yellowish color, very different from the whitish color we saw from the waxy flaky keratin of the epidermoid inclusion cyst. So if it looks like fat and has the signal of fat and the attenuation of fat, it probably is fat. It's probably going to be a lipoma. We've come to the end of our discussion of spinal masses. We learned that ependymomas oftentimes have hemosiderin capping. They have polar cysts. They can occur in the conus and cauda area as the myxopapillary ependymoma. Astrocytomas tend to present in younger patients and most commonly involve the cervical cord. Hemangioblastomas are very commonly hypervascular and are gonna clearly show a cystic or fluid filled area. These helpful hints can help us determine the differential diagnosis. Cauda equina, myxopapillary ependymoma, but always think about paraganglioma. You'll sound so bright when you include that. Flow voids suggest the possibility of a hypervascular tumor like hemangioblastoma or paraganglioma. Our localization scheme, expansion of the cord for intradural intramedullary, exterior to the cord and enlarging the subarachnoid space and displacing the cord that's the intradural extramedullary lesion and then the extradural lesions are going to displace the subarachnoid space as well as the cord away from themselves and we saw examples of all of these different lesions i want to thank you very very much for your kind attention uh, during this presentation